Hi, everyone, and welcome. This is Field Trip with Stancy Tooth in conversation with Josephine Denis. My name is Mar, and I'm the Education and Public Programs intern at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery at the Harborfront Center in Toronto. Before we begin, I hope you will join me in acknowledging the history, culture, and stewardship of the land of this region's Indigenous peoples, most recently the Mississauga of the Credit, Mississauga Ojibwe First Nation. We seek to live in respect, peace, and to right relations with them as we live and work upon their traditional territory. We are so pleased to be online with this conversation today between Stancy Tooth and Josephine Denis, the TD Curator of Education and Outreach Fellow at the Power Plant. I would now like to introduce the presenters. Stancy Tooth is a Toronto-based artist working primarily in painting, though she also makes collages, sculptures, and installations. Tooth holds a BFA from OCAD University and an MFA from the University of Ottawa. Stancy was the 2015 recipient of the Joseph Plaskett Award for Painting, through which she spent time traveling and creating new work, completing residencies in Berlin and Iceland, as well as self-directed research in Greece and Italy. Her work is included in the collections of the Royal Bank, the Toronto Dominion Bank, AT Tolley Collection, and numerous private collections. Josephine Denis was born in Haiti, raised between Port-au-Prince and New York, and currently resides in Jojage, Montreal. She is a curator and writer whose practice addresses the creation and narration of BIPOC spaces. Denis is an advocate of Black diasporic art, critical engagement, and institutional transformations through which artists and publics can co-create effective networks of change. She is currently the TD Curator of Education and Outreach Fellow at the Power Plant in Toronto, Toronto. We will now begin the conversation. Should you have any questions throughout, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Thank you and please enjoy. Thank you, Mar. Hi, Stanzi. Hi, how are you? I'm well, I'm well. How are you doing? Well, thanks. So maybe to start, you can tell us a little bit about what you're up to these days, um, what you're filling your time with um, as an artist. Sure. Um, yeah, I've been getting work ready for an upcoming show at General Hardware. Um, up until recently, I've been doing some ink on paperwork that I think we're going to look at today. Um, but now I've started kind of diverging into some mixed media pieces on canvas again. So oh, exciting. One of my time, yeah. Yeah, around the same themes. Yeah, similar um, themes, um, but just a kind of a different material exploration. Yeah. Okay, great. And um, I guess this is a question that, you know, comes up with all the artists these days, but maybe you can tell us a bit about how the pandemic may have affected your work and your practice a bit. I think it's almost easier to say how it hasn't. <laughs> no, I'm getting um, <laughs> Right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it very, it very much has affected my practice. Um, right at the beginning of the the pandemic in May of 2020, I became a mother, I had a child. So um, I was already expecting a big shift, but like new motherhood plus a global, global pandemic, uh, <laughs> understandably right. my work. Um, like the few years preceding my work had been a lot about living abroad, traveling and like explorations of different places. So it, it really, and I became very homebound um, because of COVID. Um, so it's changed a lot of my work. I found that my work has been in looking internally um, a lot more lately, um, thinking about like my body and sleep and home and things like that. Um, also, it's shifted my practice materially. I made the decision to start working from home uh, partway through COVID. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's changed things a lot, but I've found like through years of like traveling and having to work in different spaces, those ways that we adapt end up creating like new points of interest in our work. So you just make the most of it, I guess. Yeah, got to adapt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> congratulations on your baby. Thank you very much. Um, so I don't know if perhaps that's changed as well, but answer it however you'd like. Um, when you're delving into a new body of work, are there any specific stages to your practice and how it develops? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely changed over the years. Um, like, for example, before I did my MFA, I was doing these large landscape paintings that were sort of like 
impressionist leaning in their sort of style and interests. And I really planned work. Like I had all these reference images, um, like the parts of like the steps of the painting were sort of more expected. And then when I did my MFA, I decided that I really wanted to shift the way I was working. And the biggest thing for me is I completely got rid of reference imagery. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up on a forested acreage. Um, that's where I spent like all of my formative years was sort of living and working in this very specific landscape. Um, and I wanted to get to that sort of like more personal intimate space. And I realized like, I already know the spaces like internally that I want to paint. So I did away with reference imagery altogether. And so as a result, the paintings kind of became more like an exploration in and of themselves and like a process of their own making. Um, and that's affected my work ever since. I never kind of went back to that sort of way of planning. Um, but each body of work is sort of a continuum of what came before it. So that material play um, and that process that I've learned of kind of making, unmaking and editing has always been like really central to what I do. You just mentioned really quickly this sort of centering uh, the personal. Mm -hmm. And now that has me wondering like if there's anyone in your life that's been like of, of great inspiration to you, you know, personally how that's come into your work? I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess like I'm very close with my family. And like I said, we lived in this very like isolated, like my family moved from Toronto when I was nine to this um, like wooded, like former farmhouse that was in the woods. Um, and like, really like we went into town for school and things like that but we were really cut off so I have four sisters and we really spent our formative years as this like tight unit um so like especially when I was making those landscape paintings in the early years like I almost saw that figures a stand-in for myself but also like my sisters and these people I shared this place with um early on in my life but um I think that really informed my work a lot was like spending my formative years with these four women that I've spent my life with and us like working and living in the land together like we had a big garden where we grew a lot of our food and we had to like uh, collect wood to heat part of our home like we lived this very rural life there together um, and I think that's really impacted the way I look at art history and my own work as a result later. Yeah, so how do you, because the work is centering, you know, yourself, your life, the people that, you know, are close to you, how do you balance that with research? What type of research outside of that nurtures your practice? Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge art history nerd, and like specifically the history of landscape painting has always really engaged me. I mean, coming from Canada, I don't, like, you can't ex escape it when you right. like art history. Um, and I love those traditions. I'm so engaged by them. But as someone who lived this very personal experience in the landscape, I always felt um, a disconnect between that, the, these images that were really very colonial, very like myopic, this like male ownership over the landscape. And so like the work I've been doing, like especially when I like made that shift in my MFA to like express this more personal and intimate relationship with the landscape, um, I see a sort of a counterpoint to that history. So the like the study of art history is very important to me in my work, but it's also like it's in reaction to as much as it is in celebration of, I think. Um, and like outside of that, I think my work is very much like a studio based research. Like, like it's that it's as much about materiality as it is that um, conversation with art history. Well, speaking of art history, I think mm -hmm. we're gonna start looking at some of your work because sure. um, this newest series that you shared with me, I felt had a lot of art historical references actually. Definitely. Um, and when you shared this uh, new body of work, you briefly mentioned, as you did also um, previously, sleep and fragmentation being recurrent themes. 
Um, can you tell us more about what you've been exploring here? And as Stanzi is speaking, I'll probably just, you know, go through some of the works. Um, yeah, so I mean, a big part of that was like when I went back to making work after having my son, um, I was coming at it from this very different place. A lot of it, like kind of inspired by sleep deprivation, I think, like making work at night after he'd gone to bed. And um, because my work had always been about place and the body in place, um, everything was just so different. Um, like having a baby is this very like strange thing where all of a sudden a part of yourself is external <laughs> and like mm. this other person that you're caring for. So I think that like these images of like fragments or unknown spaces um, were kind of coming up in the work a lot. Um, yeah, so I think that definitely became became a part of a part of the new imagery that I was working with. And um, in Mother and Child, which we just saw, and there's the couple here, um, and parents, um, intimacy between kin and various types of loving relationships are unfolding. Um, and I was just wondering what inspired you to muse on these kinds of dynamics specifically. I mean, I think it was like a way to kind of work through my own little family kind of dealing with this like global pandemic um, together um, and just being this sort of self-contained unit. Um, all the spaces like the landscapes are very like tight in they're these very like close knit spaces. Um, but there's also like a bit of a darkness, a bit of like um, a tension in those. So like I find the figures are really sort of like connected and like wrapped into each other a lot. So it's sort of playing with that idea of like intimacy and protection and um, like containment and stuff. Yeah, but in the compositional structure as well of these works is just so interesting and um, sort of like, I wouldn't say, I don't know how to like, it just makes me feel a bit unstable when I'm looking at mm. them and, 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 you know, taking a moment with them. And I just wanted to ask you about, you know, comp compositional structure in your work in general, because I feel like this is something that comes up um, throughout your practice. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, so especially like leaving open space, blank space in my work is something that I've been exploring for the last few years because something I realized is that like leaving unmarked space in a painting and a drawing um, leaves this kind of space of potential, but it also can like automatically make something uneasy. Uh, it like adds an unknown because we're so used to like a space in an image being filled that as soon as you leave a space open, um, it leaves room for question. Um, so, I mean, that was definitely something that was part of this series because like I have been going through such a big sort of transition point and like COVID has been such a big sort of point of um, tension and transition for everyone. I've just felt like these like apertures of like space I had to leave in in the images because like I don't, I don't have the answers <laughs> sort of is I guess part of it. Yeah, it definitely draws the viewers in as well. Like you said, like because the the, the, the facial uh, features in general are also quite blurred. Um, it's very easy mm -hmm. to sort of um, project, you know, personal narratives onto the work as well. But as you said, because there's this sort of mystery to them and this like um, opacity, I would say to the work, it also makes you a bit hesitant in terms of what is the exact tone mm -hmm. of these of these stories, are they all happy or, or, you know, like what's, is a dynamic between the figures, yeah. you know, something yeah, that, I mean, that- I really want that to, sorry. No, no, <laughs> go ahead. Um, yeah, I wanted, I wanted that paradox to kind of be built in there. Um, and I think it's like, I mean, talking about art history too, like the Madonna and Child is something that kind of kept 
um, coming up in these pieces. So I started looking back at some like art historical references that I love of like Pieta imagery and stuff. But again, like instead of these like beautiful pastorals in the background, there are these tight sort of um, fraught landscapes. And I, I like that, that unease and that tension um, because I also like, motherhood is a joyful thing, but it's also like a really hard transition point. And it's something that I feel like isn't dealt with in like contemporary art that often. Um, so it's like, it was, I really wanted there to be that, that tension and that unease as well as these like sort of intimate moments. Um, in this piece, the fragments, um, I've also started using um, the images of like invasive species in some of the work as well in the, in the um, landscapes. Um, so like the idea of invasive species is that they are species not native to Canada that were brought in either for their beauty or their utility. And then they've kind of overtaken the landscape and changed even the composition of the soil beneath them because that, like they don't have any natural competition. Um, and I liked kind of juxtaposing these like beautiful Madonna and child imagery with these invasive species because it's, it's sort of like a metaphor for motherhood in a way, like it's this beautiful thing, but it changes like the, the landscape of my life has been forever changed. Like it just um, changes the, the dynamic of, of uh, these images for me. So it's something that I'm still kind of playing with as I move forward with this series. And um, just looking at these images and especially the figure at the forefront, Mm -hmm. um and the sort of veal on the the face um can you just walk us through um how you use ink um to sort of give these sort of tensions and and to create mood in your work yeah i mean ink is a material that i really fell in love with when i was in europe and then traveling for different residencies um because it has a speed to it but like i really like the indelibility of it. Like once you make a mark in ink, you can't take it back. And when you want to leave white space, you have to have the confidence to leave that space in the image because there's no like taking it back or working back from there. Um, so for these works, it just was a really interesting material to play with. Um, and like, yeah, and the black and white is something I haven't been able to get away from and just sort of worked out for these series to have these like layers of gray kind of again reinforce some of those um, images and ideas I was working through. Um, but I love that it can be a hard line and also be so soft. It um, and there can be a lot of chance and accident in it. Like I try to like let those moments happen where like water spills and you get these stainings and then kind of find the image because that's a lot how I really worked with um, oil paint before that and then no sculptures is sort of allowing the process and the materiality to dictate how the image will develop um, because for me like finding those things as I work kind of propels the making like I don't I don't have a plan I don't know what these images are going to look like when I start making them and so I kind of go into it with like an idea or um, sort of like a spatial relationship I'm thinking about, but it's really the process of their making and they kind of come to being as I'm, as I'm going. Yeah, I feel like with, with this, um, like the materiality of it as well, sort of gives us a sense of you as, as the artist, like where, you, where you've been present um, where you've worked more. And so there's like traces of that process that um, is left there and actually becomes pattern. And that's really um, captivating to me. And I in this piece, I absolutely love how the above figure is sort of sort of merging or being conflated with, with the clouds and this sort of mirroring is, is really beautiful. I love Thank this you. one. Um, so maybe we can go back a few years so that we can talk about how you got here with your practice and your technique. Um, you mentioned this piece actually being an important um, sort of reflection or comparison to what we just saw. So maybe you can tell us more 
about yeah. this series? Sure. Um, yeah, so this um, series made by place. Um, I started when I first moved to Berlin um, in 2016 or the end of 2015, I guess. Um, I just finished doing my MFA and I won the Plaskett, which is an amazing award that funds a year of travel and research. Um, Berlin was my first part of that um, year. And like, I admit to being kind of lost in my work for a little while when I got there. And I realized that I hadn't really acknowledged how much the proximity to the landscape where I grew up had been part of my work for the few years previous. Um, and so I found myself thousands of miles away from the people and places that were sort of the starting point for my work for a long time. And I knew I needed to shift things. Um, and I, it also didn't make sense to make Canadian landscapes in Germany. There was, I was just like, I have to do something new. Um, and my first studio in Berlin, where that first, that first image is from, um, on like the side here where you see the light coming in, there's this huge sandblasted window. It used to be a storefront. And you'd see these silhouettes of people passing by the window all day long. That was sort of my visual constant there. And I realized one day that like this idea of the foreign was completely reinforced by this window. Cause it was like this literal scrim between me and the outside world of this place I wasn't familiar with. Um, so when I first started making these pieces it was sort of in response to this window uh, because I'm like, I'm a, my work is always about where I am and this is where I am, it's this, <laughs> this window. <laughs> um, so I, it started by making these um, sort of um, impressions of these silhouettes and then it went from there and I actually ended up continuing this series. I stayed in Europe for a few years and I continued the series throughout. So in the end, there was about like 350, 400 wow. of these drawings. Um, and it sort of became a diary of my travels and my time away. So it'd be like snatches of people from the window or people from travels, uh, figures from the art historical pieces I was studying at the Altes uh, National Gallery in Berlin. Um, sort of all these different traces ended up in the work. Um, but the constant between all of them was this absent figure that was formed by painting the surround around it. So I wasn't actually painting the figure, that's just blank space left in the image. And instead it was being formed by sort of the pressure or the landscape around it. Um, and that really reflected where I was at at the time, kind of like feeling groundless and questioning these things like, nationality and home and place um yeah and then it became sort of the central um the centerpiece for a show in 2018 when i got back to canada mm -hmm. coming home right yeah coming home yeah um and what i i love that you sort of uh pointed this this um this, uh, what's the word, commonality between this series and um, the series before, which does it have a name now? Yeah. Pardon? Which, which series is that? The first one that we saw, so your earlier. Oh, I'm still working on, titles are always hard for me. Because I feel like they... You're great at them though. <laughs> I, I always like come to the them story. later. Um, but my gallery's always like, what's what's the title? And it's sort of my last thing is putting a name to something. Yeah, as a curator and writer, I feel like I always, well, maybe more as a writer, I always look at a title. Sometimes I have to stop myself from looking at the title before spending time with the work because it will dictate what I see. Um, but I love I love titles that that sort of help me dream and imagine, you know, with and beyond the mm. work. Um, but what I love about this series in relation to the other as well is that we have this sort of, um, if, uh, I don't know the word in, 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 in English, I'm going to say it in French, yeah. sorry, francophone here, because yeah. it's the same word, don't know how to pronounce it, ephemeralité. Ephemerality, um, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, and like this idea of, of having glimpses into someone's like very like intimate life and in passing or or whatnot, I feel like the absence that you're speaking about and sort of surrounding um, the figures um, also gives it a sense of 
of, of intimacy, you know, of being held by, um, by the colors around it. And so I really love that. Um, well, that, it's interesting because uh, like some people when they see it are like, it's ghosting, it's sad. Like they get kind of a sad ooh, sort of melancholic yeah. vibe, which I'm, I'm fine with because some of these are made out of like a melancholic place for sure. Um, but I just sort of see it as like a potential or being sort of mm -hmm. porous to the environment around oneself but yeah it's it's interesting how like those different impressions can happen yeah it's definitely works I feel like um whatever presence is embedded in its surrounding like it sort of needs it to take shape yeah um and so speaking about like landscape and nationality as you were speaking about this is definitely um a very perhaps subtle commentary on that um Sorry, you're probably hearing the soundtrack of my street right now. Um, but we're gonna keep going. Mm -hmm. um, I love this series, there are a few of them. Maybe we're gonna start with this one. Um, I feel like something that we're gonna see in, in the works that we've selected is sort of like this black and white pattern textile in the back. Mm -hmm. And yeah. these recurrent colors um, that you use in series. Um, and I was just wondering if you can talk to us again, like here, um, textiles and layering definitely become part of, of the piece as narr narrational markers. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe in this one and, and um, like the start of a journey as well, we can talk a little bit about how you use materials like that yeah um so yeah the plasters um kind of came out of that ink series um i was craving that sort of material exploration and duration that i had in making a painting um like after working in paper on paper for so long i just wanted that that sense of time um and surface in the work again but I knew it needed a different material solution than the paintings um, because it was coming from a very different place. Um, and after spending time in Athens, I'd spent a lot of time at the Acropolis Museum. And there was these amazing um, um, sculptural reliefs at the Acropolis Museum. They're worn down by like centuries of decay and war and weather. Um, but they retain these really rel relatable gestures of figures in them. And sort of just like the Made by Place series, it's the, they're formed by the surround. So that was, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, I wonder how I could make a sculpture. And I'm really not from a sculpture background, um, but I am from a fiber background. My mother is a seamstress. Um, so I started playing with different fiber materials and just like the made by place works, the figurative elements in these are cut out of the fiber um, mm -hmm. and then laid into a, a mold and I pour the plaster over top of them. So um, I really liked how the cut, just like ink, is this sort of indelible mark um, that comes out of the space. Um, and then the two materials meet to make a new hole. Um, but um, the plaster and like um, the paper, it has like this skin to it. It's like a body, it can be cut, it can be carved into, it can be blemished. Um, so uh, really, um, fiber again was like really, I think inspired by my mother in a big way. Um, and this series in particular, the textile came back to Canada be here as well because the sculptures I've been making previously used a pigment and a fiber that I found in Germany and um, I couldn't find those materials here so I decided that the materials um, had to shift along with like my location so the um, hounds tooth like that black and white um, fabric is actually the remnants of some clothing that my mother made for people in my family. She used to make like these amazing shirts for my grandfather and um, that material is sort of a remnant from the rest of that um, clothing. So I liked how it also had this like 
embedded history of home in the materials themselves because they had this connection to my family also. Yeah, I love that personal reference. And what's incredible with, you know, using um, these very extremely different materials together is that it adds to this process of abstraction that I feel is happening as I'm looking at the work because there's mm. obviously a field of, of flowers. Um, and then I see a shape of what I feel like is animals, but then we find the same material in this like checkered sky mm. um, that seems to be flowers again. So there's this sort of like, what is up, what is down type of feeling that's happening as you're looking at the work. And it's mm. really interesting how layering um, different materials you know give you that experience as a viewer um, that unsettling experience that makes it really exciting to look at as well I feel like you can interpret this work um, in various work in various ways like this area of the animal it's like the flower might be a tail or something mm -hmm. <laughs> I really love um, yeah so I love this sort of um, conversation that's happening um, between between the textiles. Thank you. Um, and then something that I wanted to look at in this series as well is, you know, in the same way that I was talking about abstraction is that, um, and I think for the text that came with this, with this series as well, um, the writer, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't remember. Powell. Sorry, say that again. Uh, Jenna Faye Powell. Yes, I think Jenna um, had mentioned the sort of um, blurring of like very um, defined figures mm -hmm. becoming more abstract and into um, becoming themselves part of a landscape. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of Made by the Mountain specifically as well. And um, yeah, I mean, we've spoken about, you know, your relationship to landscape and how, how embedded it, it is in your work, but I was just hoping maybe you could elaborate specifically with this, um, with this series here. It's like completely abstract and interpretive, um, the space you can't see. I love that. Could you just tell us a bit about that? Sure. Um, so yeah, so uh, again, I was making like these pieces all came from that coming home exhibition. And I had just like come back to Canada. I just made the decision to come back to Canada after being away for a while. And I used the made by place drawings as a starting point. So a lot of the images are actually like found in that series. And then I decided to use the, the, those um, shapes as a starting point for these more abstracted pieces. Um, and I was kind of caught in this like weird place of going back to someplace really familiar after spending many years in many unfamiliar places. Um, and so it was a looking back and looking forward and also playing with these ideas of like distance and proximity. Um, um, I'd spent a lot of time in Iceland. So it was also like these um, mountain forms came out of that period as well. And Iceland has this, I was living on a fjord and there's this weird thing when you're hiking through the mountains there every time you think you've gotten to the edge of a fjord it just kind of keeps going because you're literally just like circling around the edge of an island so you could literally just keep going on forever um so that that imagery was always like really interesting to me um but yeah i just in these works um i wanted to kind of like show that confusion of memory of a place like how imperfect it is to look back um and uh yeah and then all these sort of like morphine like mountain figure things started to kind of come out of that so um here's some work that's also a little bit later um well i mean later or past like earlier in your practice yeah. um and yeah, I know you wanted to perhaps talk to us a little bit about this. So I'm actually gonna not ask any specific questions and see if there's anything um, 
that comes up obviously from what you were saying about landscapes and memory and the confusion. I feel like you, um, us as viewers experience some sort of con confusion as well when we look at, at this work, which feels like it could be in the sea, in the air, it could be a flat surface. I feel like it could be looking up at something. Um, mm -hmm. So no questions, but I thought maybe you could talk to us about this. Um, yeah, so this was a body of work I made while I was in Germany. Um, and at the time I had read this story by the Italian writer Italio Calvino called The Distance of the Moon, which I ended up using as the title for that exhibition. And it's this really beautiful sort of surreal story about the moon being very close to the earth and how like a few sort of brave travelers can make the journey between the two spaces. Um, but to get from the earth to the moon, there's this um, sort of leap of faith, this um, um, sort of act of will to get there. And a lot of people are sort of lost in the in-between space. Um, so I just thought it was like a really beautiful story to kind of describe where I was at the time. Like I, when I was making this work, I decided to, like I was getting my citizenship in, um, um, in Berlin and staying there for a time. And, and it was just really reflective of that sort of strange in-between space that was coming out of, out of the work. Um, and, yeah, it, um, it, it feels yeah. very meditative. Um, there's a lot of like self-reflection. I feel like that's happening by um, sort of marking this like bodily shape with um, other shapes that to me feel like landscape shapes or clouds or mountains. I sort of like this layering of um, these different um, like living contexts as one. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and there's also like a weird thing that happens when you see them in person because the plaster, once it's finished, especially when it has these um, finishes on it that are sort of oxidized, it really feels like a stone tablet almost. Um, yeah. So it has this really weird sense of duration to it too, um, where the act of like pouring the plaster is like almost instantaneous. Like once you pour the plaster, you're really committed after like 30 seconds. Um, but then once it's made, like it has this sort of like timeless kind of feel where anything that's in it is embedded and like frozen in time. So I liked how it sort of had this like timeless quality, like just had a different kind of durational feel than a painting, I guess, because we see yeah. that material in such a different way. Yeah, and also the way it dries though makes me feel like there's a lot of movement happening in the work. So I like that duality. Yeah. Um, I think we're at the end of the, the like specific talk about the works, but I wanted to ask you, I mean, we've been speaking about your work and I like to sort of um, see who the artist is in community with when I'm talking to an artist. So I was just wondering if there's one artist or something in the art world right now that's exciting to you and um, that is inspiring to you, maybe an artist or a project? Yeah, I mean, it's such a big question. I mean, like, there's so many artists that I look to and whose work inspires me, like Amy Silman is someone I, whose work I always look at, Laura is someone whose work I always look at because, like, their material practices are always, like, shifting and driving their practice. Um, but then on a local level, like, even like in Toronto, we have so many amazing artists um, working here. One show that happened recently in Toronto at Patel Brown Gallery um, was Vanessa Brown, um, her recent sculptures. And I was blown away by that show. I thought it was incredible. Um, like what she's doing with negative space in her sculptural works right now, I think is super exciting. Um, and I just thought that show was like yeah. a real departure for her. Yeah, it was such a great show. Um, I, I'll, yeah. I miss that, I, I'll, I'll look for it online. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. I think she's been installation shots of it recently. It's really great. So are you, are you able um, to sort of like foster um, relationships with other artists during, you know, without being able to go see works or maybe like, you know, I feel like artists as much as curators would go into each other's 
um, studios, you know, and, and sort mm -hmm. of share and exchange. Are you still able to do that in one way or another? Definitely. I mean, I've been bubbled with my friend, the artist Liz Peed. So she's been like a touchstone for me throughout COVID. Um, she's an amazing fiber artist. So I've been learning a lot from her. Um, also doing like Zoom um, studio visits with people like Amanda Needham mm. is someone I've connected with over COVID and her work is absolutely incredible. Also, again, like doing these like really beautiful layered material explorations right now. Um, sort of the, these inky wash pieces in connection with these like really tight, refined um, pencil drawings. Her work is really incredible as well. Amazing. I love, yeah. I love to extend the knowledge and learn from artists um, about what other artists they're in love with. I feel like that's mm -hmm. the best way yeah. to learn. Um, and maybe my last question, and then if, if the, the audience has any questions, please feel free to ask in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, but I want us all who are present right now and who will maybe be watching this um, as a recording later on to help you manifest whoever <laughs> you want to collaborate with, whether that be a gallery, an institution, or an artist, and you know, tell us a bit why. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the power plant is an incredible. Uh -huh. it's like, can, can. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the power yeah. plant programming is always always blows me away. Like Beth Stewart's show there a couple of years ago. Like I, I've always loved the programming, but made me like think about the space there even in a different way. So like that's one institution that I really love. Um, I mean, another thing I've always been really interested to do is um, like deal with the institutions in the country that have these amazing landscape collections, like the AGO, the Tom Thompson, mm. the McMichael, like there's so many I could name, the National Gallery even, um, and do an exhibition that's working in concert and as counterpoint to their collection because right. I'm always so keen um to see those those when we can like work with past um artworks as well um like i saw some really interesting like exhibitions doing that in europe um and i think it's something that happens sometimes like we look at landscape painting then and now but i think it would be so exciting to do something that's maybe like a little bit more intersectional like feminist yeah almost like the landscape yeah, that would be exciting. Like it, it, it makes me think of like some sort of residency where you invite, because sometimes that'll happen with um, curators or writers that can go mm -hmm. into a collection and, you know, put something together or do research, but it would be even more exciting to have an artist go and explore, you know, like the the collections of, of a museum and sort of make work in response or in dialogue with yeah. that collection. Well, yeah, I think that's so it'll happen, no <laughs> doubt. I hope so. <laughs> we are manifesting it here. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. I feel like I learned so much about your work um, you. and I'm really excited to see you know, what happens next. And I hope to be in, in Toronto by the time mm -hmm. that your new show um, opens up so that I can be there. I would love to see your work in person. I can't believe that I've never seen your work in person and yes. we're doing this. So actually having this talk really <laughs> helped me <laughs> experience it differently. Just having you talk about the materiality. Mm -hmm. And actually maybe one last question if, I mean, we'll give people time. Sure. But as we we spoke about this previously as well, I um, feel like you have a very close relationship with writers where you um, invite people to write about series that you've made, um, which I feel like I don't see very mm -hmm. often. Um, and I just wanted to, I, I was wondering how you came about this idea and how that's like, that's very exciting to me as a writer. Yeah, I mean, language around artwork is always so interesting because it's something that's supposed to exist in this like visual physical realm and then we're like asked to put words to it um 
and I consider myself like an adept writer. Like I, I've worked in like uh, as a gallery director and a, as a writer in, in another life. Um, but when it comes to my own work, I always hesitate to put words and titles and things to it um, because it, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of openness in my work by design and then I feel like it caps it off in a way because I don't want to direct people in how to see it. Um, so it's sort of something that came out of my MFA, I guess, because I did my MFA with um, the wonderful artist and writer Jessica Bell, who wrote the text for my show, um, The Distance of the Moon. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wrote a beautiful essay for the show. And it came out of a conversation we were having with the work. And I just asked her, I'm like, will you write this text for me? Because I just love that collaborative sort of spirit when it comes to writing. Um, I mean, I think that curators and writers like have like a very important place in what we do as artists in our like ecosystem. And it just made sense to me to kind of put it forward to someone who I had like trust in to write, to write the work for me. And like, there's a lot of me in the text just because it came out of conversations, but mm -hmm. I just like having that distance to have someone write right for me just felt more natural to me yeah being like, this is me and this especially because there's so much of like my personal life in the work and I don't think people necessarily need to know that to experience the work and to appreciate it and I don't want it to be like a diary entry like this is yeah, me it and troubles this labels me. it like troubles a label like and it's not like an artist statement you know, yeah. it's like really a collaborative commentary on yeah. your process. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a there's another type of, of like networking and intimacy that happens by, you know, inviting the audience to get this like firsthand um, perspective on your work because the person writing on it has, you know, a specific relationship to you. Mm -hmm. and so there's yeah we're I, I it's it's a very welcoming way of experiencing your work so I and, love that and Jenna who wrote another text that you made mention of she and I had actually started doing like a drawing exchange while I was in Germany oh, and so we had this exchange of going back and forth with our work and so I also asked her to write the text for that exhibition too because she was sort of like actively involved in that process of my like coming home and working with me as I was making that transition. So it just, again, felt like this natural extension. I love it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Josephine. This was exciting. I feel like I could go on, but I'm not <gasps> gonna <laughs> ask people to stay with us too long. Yeah. Um, so I maybe am gonna ask Mar to join us back. And if, if no one, I mean, we'll give people maybe a minute or two, but thank you so much to everyone that was here. Thank you, Stanzi. I'm just so excited to, to continue this dialogue with you and hopefully we will collaborate yeah. um, at the power plant and or elsewhere. And thank you, Mar. Yes, thank you, Mar. Well, we give everyone a minute to get their, get their Q and A's in. I, actually have a question. Um, you talk a lot in your work about place being important and how you get your your inspiration from where you are, where you're going to be. And um, especially with the pandemic that has changed from, I guess, traveling to, to the home. And I guess my question is, mm -hmm. does that process feel different making work that is I guess, about being stationary rather than moving around? Or does it feel very much kind of all mm -hmm. the in the same place? I mean, I guess like whenever I kind of like look to myself, I go back to that like home landscape, I guess, the, that place where I grew up, um, that like small forest of like my family home. And actually during COVID, um, like the two people we've been bubbled with really consistently are my parents. Um, so we've spent some time and things like that. We've <laughs> gone to like live with them in the woods. So um, I think that landscape imagery also came directly out of like being back in that place with my with my little family. 
Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it definitely changed because I was like, do I just start making like pictures of like the laundry on my floor in my apartment? <laughs> I just, I wanted to kind of like find an imaginative place to kind of deal with those relationships. So I always kind of go back to those landscape images I find. But I keep thinking about the um, invasive species and the Madonna and child, that one piece. Um, just, it's incredible and it's, it's oh, living out here. Yeah. Uh, that's just not a, not a juxtaposition I would have I think ever come to on my own so it's so great to have that opportunity to see your work and to see that and to get new ways to consider the relationships between things thanks yeah and I mean it sounds like such a kind of dark title like invasive species um but yeah I just I think it's so interesting just like kind of considering these um things in our in our everyday environment and like just how they kind of affect us so yeah thank you we have a super exciting question maybe more i'll let you read it out loud <laughs> uh it's from adrian and it says uh i have a question about fiction and your work i remember your thesis show and in brackets if i remember correctly Reference it referenced surfacing by Margaret Atwood, and I was wondering how you balance the influences of fictional and personal narratives in your work. Good question. Yes, thanks, Adrian. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so I am a big avid reader, just like that other series was sort of um, took its name from the Italo Calvino story. Um, my thesis show I titled after the Margaret Atwood book surfacing, which was a really sort of foundational text for me because it's about this woman who lives in the city who has to go back to her family home in rural Quebec and um, goes through this like literal and figurative transformation um, and like becomes one with the landscape basically. Um, so it really, resonated with some of the things that were coming to my show. I didn't make the show about the story, but then when I, again, when I have to go into this um, place of having to like label things and put text to them, um, thinking again, like that goes to Josephine's question about writers. I also like think about writers who resonate with me when I have to put language to things. Um, so in that instance, it was Margaret Atwood, who's just like one of my all time favorites. It's incredible, yeah. Great. Thank you, Adrian. That was such a good question. Yeah, thank, thank you so it. much for that. All right. Well, maybe we'll call it um, a day. This was so amazing. Thank you so much, Sandy. And thank you, everyone that joined us. Um, I'm just really happy to be here with you. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you for coming up despite the beautiful day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you both Josephine and Stanzi for your insightful conversation and Stanzi thank you for your time and sharing your amazing practice and Josephine for your thoughtful questions and a big thank you for everyone who yes came here on this very sunny beautiful Saturday afternoon to listen. Um, this conversation has been recorded and is going to be posted on the Power Plants YouTube uh, probably in the next coming week if you want to watch it again. Um, and coming up at the power plant on June 23rd at one, we have Horizon Grant Writing for Artists, where the power plant has invited representatives from agencies at all three levels of government to share information about grants and tips for writing grants. And on June 27th at 2 p.m., we have a field trip with Aidan Solway, who was recently the curatorial assistant of live projects and performance at the AGO, and he'll speak about how we chose exhibition uh, from Swelling Shadows, we draw our bows. Thank you again to everyone for joining us and I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon.